Hey everybody, this is Chris with the Ancient Scholar, and today what I want to do is I want to talk about something known as uh, Slater's Slater's Rules. All right, these are a set of rules that can be used uh, to identify uh, the z effective for any electron in pretty much any atom. Um, what is z effective, however, and that's what I want to talk about real quick before I go on to actually describing what the rules are themselves. So just uh, take a trip, we'll take a trip down uh, memory lane here real quick. So if you remember the, uh, the fundamental equation that we use to find out about electrons is the Schrodinger equation and I'll just put the, uh, the time independent form H psi equals E psi and I've done this on many videos. Okay, so what happens is we can solve for the binding energy of an electron. And, uh, I'm gonna, uh, and a way that we can do that, a formula that we can use to find the binding energy um, is the following, and that is negative one over n squared, multiply, that's not cross product, that's just multiplication, multiply by the mass of the, um, the electron, the charge on the electron to the fourth power, um, divided by eight, epsilon naught's the permittivity of the vacuum squared, Planck's constant squared, just like that. So all I need to do is I need to plug, I just need to plug the n value in, okay, n equals one, n equals two, whatever. Um, and the really cool thing is all the rest of this stuff is, is just a constant, and people realize that rather quickly. And in fact, we can take this whole side of the equation here, because these are nothing but constants. These, these don't change. It doesn't matter what the n is, what the value for n is. These all remain the same. And so what we can do is we can take these, um, find out what the value is here, and then just use that value. And in fact, this whole thing here is known as the Rydberg constant, or R sub h. And that equals approximately 2.17, some people use 2.18, um, times 10 to the negative 18 joules. All right, so that's a Rydberg constant. Um, I should say that the convenient unit uh, of binding energy that we often use, however, is um, the electron volt. Um, so we often convert we often convert this to EV when dealing with uh, binding energies. Um, in fact, the uh, Rydberg constant equals, okay, 2.17 times 10 to the negative 18 joules equals um, approximately 13.6 electron volts. Okay, all right, so what we can say then with this, this constant, we can rewrite this formula, we can really simplify it, and we can say that the energy, the binding energy, E, E equals uh, the negative um, R sub H, that's the Rydberg constant, that's this guy here, divided by N squared, all right? So fair enough. So then what we can do is we can take this equation here, and we can use this to find the binding energy the binding energy, that's what E is, of any electron in any state in the hydrogen, the hydrogen atom. All right, use the binding energy in the hydrogen atom, really, really easy to do. Um, all we need to know is the N, okay? It doesn't matter what orbital, okay? You don't need to know L, you don't need to know, um, you don't need to know M sub L, you don't need to know M sub S. The only quantum number you need to know for a hydrogen atom is n, because all of the orbitals are in degenerate states in the hydrogen atom. That is to say that they're the same energy, so it doesn't matter if the electron is in a 2s orbital or a 2p orbital, all the states are, are degenerate in that, that case. So this is really ridiculously simple when it comes to the hydrogen atom, okay? All you have to do is you just divide, okay, all you have to do to find the binding energy is just take the negative of the Rydberg constant 
divided by whatever n, n squared is. What, what if we're talking about the first energy level? Well, you just put in 1. 1 squared is 1. So it's just the negative of the Rydberg constant divided by 1, which just is just the negative Rydberg constant, or 13.6 EV, negative 13.6 EV. Uh, the negative is just kind of a convention that we use, and we say that negative means that the atom is, uh, the electron is in a bound state. It's, it's the more negative, the more closely bound, the more heavily bound it is. Easy. If we wanted to find n equals 2, you just plug 2 in, you'd square it, 2 times 2 is 4, and then the Rydberg constant divided by 4, convert that to electron volts, you got it. And we've done this on other videos. Uh, I've done some spectroscopy videos that you can take a look at. Where we've calculated the binding energies, and then we've actually excited the hydrogen um, atom. We've looked at the emission lines, the Balmer series, and we know that this the, the predictions here, um, the predictions predict the exact wavelengths that we see um, when we do spectroscopy. So we know it works. Well, what is missing in this formula here is what I'm going to talk about here. So we're going to move on beyond the hydrogen atom now. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that um, I can generalize this a bit more. And I can say that for any, any, okay, any one electron, any one electron atom, okay, any one electron atom, I can find the binding energy. So I could find the binding energy of, say, uh, helium plus, right? That is um, ionized helium. That is helium with just one electron. Um, I could find the binding energy of electron if lithium uh, two plus, okay? That's uh, lithium without two electrons or lithium with just one electron, okay? Um, so I can generalize that a bit more. And all I need to do is I just go E equals negative Z squared R sub H divided by N squared, okay? Now this term Z, Z is the nuclear, the nuclear charge, all right? Z is a nuclear charge. And so that's the, that's really, that's uh, the charge in the nucleus, okay? Um, is it you know one one proton, two protons, three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And what's the charge on those? So all we have to do here is, for example, on helium, helium has two protons. Okay, so we plug that in, okay, multiply it by the Rydberg constant and then divide it by what whatever n that, that electron happens to be in. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. And then finally, we're starting to get to the point where um, the Slater's rules are, are going to come, come in handy. And that is, what if we have a multi, a multi-electron, a multi-electron atom, okay? We run into a problem. In, in, this, in the setting of a multi-electron atom, here's a problem. So I have my nucleus, okay? And then I have electrons in different energy levels, okay? So we'll say I have electron here, electron here, electron here. I know they're not really in, in orbits, but whatever. I'm just going to draw that. Okay, well, here's the problem. We have a much more complicated system than a system like this where I have my nucleus and I only have one electron. Okay, it's pretty straightforward that the, really the only thing that I'm concerned about is, is what is the Coulomb, Coulombic attraction between the electron and the nucleus, okay? That's a pretty straightforward situation. In this situation, however, not only do these electrons have a, a Coulombic interaction, okay, they're attracted to the nucleus, but because electrons are negatively charged, these electrons are going to be repelling one another. Okay, that's the green here. So there's going to be some repulsion here. They'll all be kind of repelling each other. All right. And um, accounting for this repulsion is actually exceptionally difficult.
in quantum mechanics, and it kind of has to do with uh, the Hamiltonian, and it, it's just it's it's exceptionally difficult to separate um, some of those variables in the in, in the Hamiltonian, um, and we can't actually solve the multi-electron atoms um, exactly uh, because of that. Um, so there's this concept known as screening. All right, there's a concept known as screening where we can kind of model the atom, and what we can do is we can say, well, if I have the nucleus here, and I have electrons um, around the nucleus, um, let's say that I have this electron way out here, these electrons kind of screen, okay? They kind of put up a screen around the nucleus, so this electron here doesn't feel the full charge of the nucleus. This isn't really what happens. It really what it is is it's just the repulsion between the electrons. But if we can kind of model it like these these other electrons are kind of screening it, kind of preventing this from feeling the full charge of the nucleus, we can actually get somewhere. And so what we do is we say that um, if we're looking at this electron here, we don't want to know what we, we we don't know want to know what z is okay we don't want to know what the nuclear charge is because some of that charge is screened from this electron so instead what we do is we want to know what the effective the effective nuclear charge we want to know the effective nuclear charge um, and that is something known as z effective z e f f or Z subscript EFF. So then what we can do to find the binding energy of any electron in any, any atom um, to include multi-electron atoms is, is we need to find Z effective and then we plug that Z effective in for that whatever atom we're talking about. And the formula is negative Z effective squared times the Rydberg constant divided by n squared, okay? That seems pretty straightforward, but here's a problem. Um, it, we know z, right? We know z, that's just the atomic number um, on in any of our one electron atoms, but how do I know z effective? How do I, how do I get that? Um, well, there's been a lot of empirical empirical data where we've just had to do the groundwork and do spectroscopy and ionize them and look at the the wavelengths of light and really kind of figure out okay what you know what's going on and um, there are a set of rules uh, rules of thumb that we can use to get a really close um, really close fairly accurate estimate of what the z effective will be for any electron and those rules are known as Slater's Slater's rules and so in the next couple of videos, I'll talk about how we can, what, what these are and how we can use them to find the Z effective. Um, to, we can use them to find out how much screening or shielding there is for a particular atom. And, and, and it is kind of a messy, convoluted thing, um, but we will go through it in all of its glory and um, just start basic and work our way up and hopefully it'll start making some sense. But anyway, I just want to do a quick video talking about the, the setup for why we actually need these Slater's rules. What, why, why do we have to do it? You know, what was the, what's the whole issue with multi-electron atoms? And hopefully this, this makes some sense. Okay, uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. As always, thanks for hanging in there.